today is uh, chapter 15. Yeah? Today will probably be the last lesson in this volume 20, the Sutta Discovery. It is uh, Puno Vada Sutta M145. This Sutta is very powerful in the sense that uh, it's a story about a monk who is planning to go back to his whole country to teach, teach the Dharma. Uh, it, it is difficult for us sometimes to, to teach in our own home, so to speak, home country, home homeland. Why is that? Imagine, you know, let's say you know Buddhism, you go back to your family and you try to teach them. Or teach them even to your loved one. Yeah? They probably look at you and laugh at you and say, oh, you know, we know you, you are like this, you are like that. People tend to judge us, people tend to see us as a fixed entity. Yeah? So it is very difficult for us to teach Dharma in our own country, so to speak. Yeah? That is why you find many uh, monks, nuns, and even uh, religious teachers, they, they tend to go elsewhere to teach, where people do not know them. And so does not have any uh, kind of uh, opinions about them, so to speak. Yeah? In other words, teaching, teaching religion it, it is a very tough thing. There are two big problems here. Number one is, uh, what we're teaching, is it correct? Is it true? That's the first thing we have to ascertain. And secondly, will it grow? This teaching we give, will it grow? Will people like it? People always want something exciting, something interesting, something they like, something they find meaningful. Of course, it's all according to their own definition. So it's not always easy to tell people the truth. Sometimes we tell people they won't listen. And then when they have problems, they come to us. And it's very hard to help them, right? And uh, sometimes we, we want to give them the right thing, like sutras, for example. Again, it's not easy. For one thing, the sutras appear to be difficult. That is because we have not done enough work to translate them properly, to simplify them. It is still the process of being done. But ironically, there are actually efforts in some quarters to, in a sense, play down the sutras. Some people say, oh, the sutras are out of date, you must modernize with this. Uh, yeah present it like management, package it, manage it, things like that, you know. Such methods may well work to attract members, yes, but when it comes to meditation, which is the key practice in Buddhism, we know very well it's every person for himself. So this one aspect you must never forget. Ultimately, you have to sit down all by yourself, be at peace with yourself. That's a very important thing. So if you go to a so-called Buddhist center and you don't feel the peace, very noisy, people are dancing and making noise and laughing and there's no peace of mind, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Sometimes when, when, when you go to Buddhist conferences or so, you find some of the people who are supposed to be leaders and then teachers, even meditation teachers, the things they say are quite surprising. It just shows that they they don't really have peace of mind. And you go to sometimes some kind of a Buddhist dinners, you find again, you are very surprised you know, how little these people know about the life of a man, for example, or the Dharma, for that matter. Sometimes monks are invited to attend, sing songs and dances, and even made to come out on stage to sing all kinds of join them in singing songs and things like that. And these are all breaking the rules of the mind and we get the mind to trouble also. So this is where, these are things we need to think carefully about when we deal with the mind. To show the proper respect and learn the Dhamma from them, not to use them in other ways. In other words, being a monk is not easy at all. The lots, and these problems I've mentioned are only very minor, social misdemeanor, if you like, yeah? social aberrations, strange happenings. So let's find out what sort of problem this Unna 
as his spine is called, what problem does he face? How did the Buddha test him, so to speak, to find out whether he's ready or not? Let's look at the Sutta, straight away, the translation on page 154. Now look at the number first. This, uh, the citation is M145. Majima, Sutta 145. Yeah? Unno Wada Sutta. Unna is the name of his name. Unna means something like fulfill, accomplish, accomplish. O Wada means advice, yeah? Sutta, discourse, yeah? the discourse on the advice to Punna. Thus have I heard. At one time, the Blessed One was staying in Anatta Pindika's park in Jitavana, near Savaki. Then the Varanga Puna, having emerged from his evening retreat, approached the Blessed One. Having approached the Blessed One, he saluted him and sat down at one side. Seated us at one side, the Varanga Puna said this to the Blessed One. It would be good, Bhante, if the Blessed One were to give me a brief word of advice. Having heard the Dharma from the Blessed One, I will dwell alone, aloof from society, heedful, exertive, and resolute. So here we see a very common event in monastic training. Even today, you go to the forest monasteries, not in the city temples though, the proper meditative centers, the younger man will ask the teacher, uh, I would like to go for a retreat. Uh, what practice shall I do? Okay, so, to, to take leave of the teacher. In this case here, Puna takes leave of the Buddha and asks the Buddha for a meditation subject, instructions to reflect on. So, this is the, like a, what do you call this, uh, stop passage. Yeah? Then the Buddha says, in that case, Puna, listen, pay close attention, I will speak. Yes, Bhante. The Rukmana Puna answered the Blessed One in assent. And then comes the instructions. Now the instruction comes in sections. So the first part is called the six central strands, the six senses. And then this whole part, so there are two parts, positive and negative, positive. And then the interesting part is the next section, page 156, the missioner's courage. And then it closes with Puna back home in Suna Paranta. Now, Suna Paranta is where Bombay is today, on the west coast of India. So, in other words, if you picture India, it's like a triangle, like a beehive. Savati is in the center, and then uh, Bombay or Suna Paranta goes down a bit to the southwest on the coast. Yeah? Yeah, the distance is quite far. It's, uh, I think, about See. Where's the distance given in your book here? Yeah? See page 152? Uh, 146. Page 146, about 900 miles or 1,500 kilometers away. Okay? That's quite far. How far is that? Twice the distance to KL, eh? Isn't it? So to Penang maybe, or even to the border of uh, to the border of Thailand, not that far. So you could travel all the way. Okay, so the first teaching. The person one said this. Uh, the first part, how suffering arises. Puna, there are forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desirable, agreeable, likable, connected with sensuality, arousing lust. If a monk delights in them, welcomes them, and remains holding on to them, delighting, delight arises in him. Punna, the arising of the with the arising of delight, there is the arising of suffering. I say. Okay, this is the key paragraph. We have to understand this. This is meant for reflection. You may say, "Oh yes, I heard this before." There's something good about translating the suttas, you know. You say, okay, this is familiar. But sometimes you notice there are certain phrases and words change. 
Next thing you must see the contents. So here form. Now once you see form, you've got to see the next. What's the next word? The next word is, number two is, sounds. Then you know, smell, taste, touch, mind objects. So these are the six sense objects, six sense, six sense faculties. Sometimes we have form, feeling, perception, and formation, consciousness, that's by the case. So here, in a sense, the Buddha has given Puna a very simple meditation teaching. So it seems. But like all things, we must not underestimate simple teachings because the impact is very deep. It's just like, you know, someone tells us, keep to the road. You know, your, your instructor, your traveling instructor says, you make sure you keep to the road. Do not ever take any small turns. Huh? Oh, there's some fairy tale. Huh? This boy is told, say, you go to this forest. There's a beautiful hut in the forest. Huh? You go there, you get something from me from this wicked witch. But when you enter this house, you must make sure you don't touch any other thing, and especially don't eat anything from the house. It's a gingerbread house, remember the story, yeah? the, the, the witch and the gingerbread house is the witch, it's children, so the story goes. But this little boy was too tempted. He ate something, almost got in trouble. Yeah? So also, the teacher says, keep to the road. Sometimes we say, oh, never mind, and, and don't stop. The teacher said, don't stop. And we say, never mind, let's take a rest. Let's go on the track again for a short break, and then you are into trouble. So here the Buddha is saying, okay, reflect on this. Forms, that means visual forms, shapes, colors, things we see. You can't stop seeing things, but here what the Buddha is saying, do not hold on to them. If you delight in them, things which are delightful, if you delight in them, and you keep thinking about them, you get into trouble. So in other words, what the Buddha is telling us, you see things, you just look at them, they come, they go, that's it. Don't bring them home. Home is your mind, by the way. Sometimes the mind is called Oka, not home. The home of consciousness. So there's another meaning of it. Don't bring thoughts home. Don't, I mean, don't bring all this form home. Just don't keep it in your mind. You keep on it in your mind, you won't, you won't be functional. You won't be happy. Madness is where you can't get rid of a certain thought or idea which is negative. It's really stuck permanently in your mind, so to speak. So stuck that you think that's real, something bad. So that's your, your reality, your very private, limited reality. No one else has a reality, only you, so it's called madness. So that's very dangerous. Huh? So here, the Buddha says, Puna, with the arising of delight, there is the arising of suffering. From pleasure comes pain. This is a very important idea to understand. Sometimes we say, life is full of suffering. Eh? Maybe you should say life is full of pleasure also, can Because when the pleasure is gone, the suffering. We go together, see? But all this must be seen in context, you know? Because some religions say, oh, Buddhism is so negative, you know? I talk about it. Here we are so happy, you know. But then you see the Pope resigning, you see all these children being molested for centuries, for the thousands. You even see murders going on in some cults. Only yesterday I received a letter from another, from a close friend. She says, oh, you know, I, I met this colleague, my colleague, you know, who found out I'm doing social work in India. I'm so happy and kind, and she even donated money to me. To, to give to the children in India. Then I found out they turned to my shop. She, she's kind of nice, yeah. But her teacher is a local person who claims to be a Tuku, who claims to be an incarnate lama. Can you imagine that? And he's just like, imagine if I claim that I'm an incarnate lama, you know? so now you come to me, you must bow down and this and that. <laughs> so imagine, you know, what kinds of strange beliefs we have towards people. So these are all going off the way, right? going off the way. So the Buddha always says, look within, look within. You look outside, it's not real. You look outside, it's false. It's impermanent, it's changing all the time. In that sense, it's false. 
So if you are caught up with something, you, you, you see it's very nice and beautiful, and then you hold on to it, that's the end. Because beauty is also impermanent, it changes, it changes. But when you understand this, then you feel truly happy. So what the Buddha is saying, don't get cheated by the false things. Look, look for the real thing. The real thing is how you look at things, not the thing themselves. Right? So once you see something special arising, if you hold on to it, you're going to be happy when you listen. Just let it go. It's just like you see a beautiful butterfly. You can't, you can't kill it. It's beautiful because it's alive, it's flying, and you see it moving around. It's very beautiful. You don't have to own it, you don't have to grasp it. What if you were the butterfly? Would you let people to pin you and kill you and label you? We won't want that, right? So, beauty is out there. We can enjoy it, we can look at it, and we feel happy. That's what we want. And the happiness cannot be forgotten. Now, since you all are familiar with this part, I'm not going to get through everything. It's a quite long sutta. So the second part, sounds. That's the same thing. Beautiful sound, nice sounds around us. Let them come, let them go. Right? And then smells. Same thing, reflect on smells. Smells may be beautiful, maybe nice smell. They come, they go, they're permanent. Number four, taste, also same. They come, they go. Don't be too bothered about them. And then touches, feeling, yeah, hot, cold, and so on. Also impermanent. Mind objects, thoughts, they calm, they go. Nothing to worry about, just let them calm, let them go. Remember, these are not easy things to do. That's why the Buddha leads them in this way, to remind us. Buddha is reminding us of the time. These are the things, these are the six doors to which beautiful things appear to us. And if you get caught up with them, then you are suffer. In other words, we just let them come, welcome them, and then say goodbye to them. Hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye. Right? And then the second part, yeah? second part, section four, how suffering ends. Puna, there are forms recognizable by the eye, there are wishful, desirable, agreeable, likable, connected with sensuality, arousing lust. If a monk, meaning a meditator here, delights not in them, welcomes them not, and remains not holding on to them, delights Delight does not arise in him. Punna, with the ending of delight, there is the ending of suffering, I say. Right? So, just let them come, let them go. Same thing. Sounds, smell, taste, touches, why not touch? So this is the teaching. Eh? I'm sure Punna has said this before. But this is the teaching the Buddha specifically gives him, so reflect on this. But it's only the first part. This is something well known, very famous. And then the Buddha now asks him, where are you going? Right? Notice, there's no secret teaching here. Eh? No uh, strange sounding koan thing. Koan was invented in China, not in India. And you won't get enlightened with koans. You got to get certified. I'm not working. So here, the Buddha has given this meditation object to Punna, and now he asks Punna where he's going. Right? Page one five six. The mission has courage. Section five. Well, now that I've given you a word of advice in brief, in which country will you dwell? Where are you going? Bante. said Puna. Now that the Blessed One has given me the word of advice in brief, I'm going to dwell in the country called Sunaparanta. Sunaparanta. In Sunaparanta, the capital city is Kosopara. This uh, 
Hawk Town is still there in India, an ancient town. Uh, then the Buddha passed Punna. Now the next section is very famous. It's called the, what you call, the list of gradual suffering. Eh? If you look at four point, section 4.2, it's called a graduated scale of ill treatment. A graduated scale of ill treatment. What does this mean? Let's look at it. Back to page 156. Puna, the people of Sunna Paranta are fierce. Puna, the people of Sunna Paranta are rough. If Puna, they were to scold you or were to insult you, what Puna would you then think of them? Okay, what would happen if they scold you? No? They, they insult you. Then Puna replies, Pante, if the people of Sunna Paranta were to scold me or were to insult me, then I shall think thus. These people of Sunna Paranta are kind, truly kind, in that they do not punch me with their fists. Now, if you can think like that, I think you, you can be a very good missionary. Eh? You can be a good salesman also, by the way. <laughs> in Singapore, is a good salesman. Okay? Thus, I will think of them, blessed one. Thus, will I think of them, Sukata, well, welfare. Okay? Sukata welfare sounds better. Okay, then Buddha says, but Puna, if the people of Sunaparanta were to punch you with their fists, what Puna would you then think of them? Again, Puna says, Bhante, if the people of Sunaparanta were to punch you with their fists, then I shall think thus. These people of Sunaparanta are kind, truly kind, in that they do not hit me with a clod of earth. Right? They just punch me, they don't throw me with a big lump of hard earth. <laughs> Then Buddha says, you can all rest, cast the curtain now. Eh? Okay, what if they throw a big hard lump of earth on you? Then Buddha says, oh, they're still very kind. They, you know, they only throw clots of earth on me, at me, but they do not hit me with rods and sticks. Okay? Then the Buddha says, okay, what if they hit you with, with sticks? Then Sunaka uh, is, Buddha says, oh, they're still nice, they're still kind. Because they don't hit me with knives. It's getting worse now. So the Buddha says, why did they hit you with knives? I say, oh, those, those knives are not sharp, but they're just blunt knives, okay. Then the Buddha says, why did they have sharp knives? This is number six, eh? Then the Buddha says, Bhante, the people of Sunaparanta would have attacked me with sharp knives. Then I still think that these people of Sunaparanta are kind, truly kind, in that they have not taken my life with the sharp knives. They didn't kill me. Now comes the final point, number seven. What did they kill you, Puna? What did they kill you? That's the final question, huh? And what does Puna say? Okay, this is the remarkable reply he gives at the bottom of page 156. Bante, if the people of Sunaparanta were to take my life, with sharp knives. Then I shall think thus. They have been, there have been disciples of the Blessed One who, being repelled and disgusted by the body and by life, have resorted to a knife bringer. But I have not sought the knife. It is the knife that has sought me. Thus I will think of them, Blessed One. Thus will I think of them, Sukhata. Well, fair. Okay, this part is not easy for people to accept. That is why Puna is very special. Puna says, if they kill me, I will be very happy. Because in the Buddha's teaching, you find some disruptions. They're not afraid to die. They, sometimes they feel so disgusted with their bodies that they actually ask a certain bad people, you know, to kill them. Even, you know, you put contract on themselves. They pay some of these bad guys, say, kill me. And this is not, this is not the standard teaching. <laughs> this is not standard teaching. You know, some of those monks will really have these uh, ideas from which, which uh, the Buddha made a rule saying suicide is not enough because of that, you know. Uh, there's a big controversy on this, where some of these monks, they're so engrossed in their meditation, 
on the impurities that they regard their bodies as impure, and so they kind of they are willing to give it up. And this kind of idea also was transferred to Japan to the kamikaze warriors, you know. So they, they kind of they were like brainwashed to kill themselves. So in a sense, you see, remember this Buddha is not an arahant. He's just saying he's very brave and he's kind of dedicated. It's almost like a Buddhist suicide squad, if you like, at this point, you know. So the Buddha is simply asking him. So he says that others ask to be killed. But here, these people, they have come and killed me. So I'm grateful to them. You know, they have ended this uh, vile, impure body of mine. So I will not hit them for that. Remember, he was not really killed. You know? He's just saying that he will not have hate to us. So the point here is, now remember, this, up to this point, we cannot say that the sutta endorses suicide or people killing us. No, it doesn't mean that. The, the Buddhism doesn't have any concept of martyrdom. This is the closest you know, to martyrdom. Martyrdom means uh, dying for the religion and you become like a saint. You know. People may or may not become martyrs, depending on how the people look up to all these people. But in Buddhism, we do not have this idea as canonical, so to speak. This is the closest we have. What is interesting here is that uh, what the Buddha is trying to say is a monk should not retaliate. Even if you, you are to die, let yourself be killed rather than you take a life. This is really you know, the, the, the farthest that any, any teaching on value of life can go. There's no but about it. So in that sense, it's a complete teaching. It's not easy to follow, very ideal. There is another sutta connected with this, even more frightening than this. Remember the discourse of the parable of the double-edged sword, Kakachupama Sutta. The Buddha says, if, if thieves and robbers will catch you and beat you up, you, know, you should not get angry with them. Even if they are to use a long double man sword and cut you in half, you, know, you should not hate them. Because if you show any hate to them, then you have not followed my teaching. So this kind of teaching is very clear. That means there should be no Buddhist warriors, no Buddhist soldiers. In, in Japan, there, there, there are uh, monk samurai, Sohei, who protected the wealth and power of the monasteries. And, and this really got the rulers worried. And their karma was really bad. You know? true karma in this case. In fact, because of this kind of development in, in, in the medieval Japan, the later powers introduced, very cunningly introduced laws that effectively destroyed monasticism in Japan. In Japan, called the Nikujiki Saitai law, which means to take meat and uh, get married. Months nuns are get uh, take me, get married. Those, there are other laws, but these two laws effectively destroy the monasticism in Japan. That is why all those people who follow Japanese Zen, they can't call themselves monks or nuns, or Masanga, because they are not monks or they are lay people. So these are very sad consequences once you get involved with power. Because the Dharma is meant to be an alternative to worldly power. It is the love mode, loving kindness. So sutta like this remind us of that approach. So the Buddha is very impressed. The, the Buddha tells Sakuna, section six. So good, good, sadhu, sadhu, Sakuna. Endowed with such discipline and stillness, you will be able to dwell in a country called Sunaparanta. Please, Puna, do as you seem fit here. Now, these are the kind of teachings that, in, in a sense, you know, this meaning to people who really work hard for the Dharma. Sometimes we face a lot of difficulties when we teach Dharma. Even when you teach suttas, strangely, you might say, well, what's the problem with teaching suttas? Isn't it wonderful? Oh, you'll be surprised. There are lots of nuns and nuns and people who don't like suttas. Because suttas tell you, uh, to meditate. Monks should not use money. Monks should not have relationship with women and so on. You know? 
And, and uh, if you do not know this, you think, oh, it is modern, you know, monks can do what they like, they can upgrade themselves. But once you read the sutta, you find, wow, this is what the Buddha said. You know? And the Buddha even gave warnings ahead, so this is what is going to happen in the future if, if these monks are not uh, properly trained. So the less you know the sutta, the more you hide the sutta, the more havoc there will be in the name of Buddhism. In fact, today, if you look at Buddhism, if you really look hard, the level of Buddhism is on today is just like Christianity during the Middle Ages. We worship relics, we do strange magical chants, but we think that by making married we can go to heaven, no matter what else we do. Uh, we, we think there's something called karmic purification ceremonies. We worship teachers because we think they're magical, they're powerful, or even enlightened. Where in the suttas do we find this kind of teaching? The Buddha, the Dharma tells us it doesn't matter if someone else is enlightened. What about we ourselves? We have to strive, we have to make sure we ourselves are safe. Because no one, someone else's enlightenment cannot enlighten you just like that. Someone else's enlightenment is it, like a light, you know? But you're not a light. You have to lighten up yourself, you can. You want to. So this this is a foolproof way of not getting into trouble in religion. You find the history of all religions, they have done the worst that men can do to each other. Wars and, and, and massacres and all kinds of terrible things have happened. If not for the rise of science and knowledge and uh, open understanding and learning, we will still be struggling with the atrocities of religion. Because religion is based on belief, whereas wisdom is based on direct experience. And the Dharma teaches us to experience directly. The opening of the Sutta, the Buddha says, form, feeling, uh, form, sound, smell, taste, touch, all these are experienced directly. See them as impermanent, that go of time. So that's the teaching. So, Puna understands, and he says, yeah, I'm ready. Even if they kill me, fine, right? So this is where, it's quite a hazardous thing to be a Dharma teacher of suttas nowadays, in a sense, you know, not speaking, especially to tell the truth. Especially when you just, you don't dance the tunes of the powerful. You say, no, this is what Sutta says, and this is what I'm going to teach. So the thing is, it's worth a price, so to speak, because if we do not, raise a sutta to public awareness, what kind of Buddhism are we going to say? Is it really Buddhism? Nothing more than superstition, right? So, the teaching ends there. Now to go historical uh, notes, no? Section 7, page 157, section 7, Sun Puna in Suna Bhavanta. Then, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's word, the Venerable Puna rose from his seat. Having saluted the Blessed One, he circumambulated him. In other words, the right side towards the Buddha. It was one round. Then he set his lodging in order. So he goes back to his kuti, to his cell, arranged everything nicely. And taking rope and bow, he set out on his walk towards Sunaparanta country. Wandering by stages on the teaching tour, he eventually arrived in Sunaparanta country. Well, I don't know how long this would take. Imagine 1,500 kilometers. How many miles do you think someone can walk a day? Any idea? Yeah? How many kilometers do you walk? Yeah, 10 kilometers? Or maybe more? So I don't know how long you take. 1,500 is quite, quite a distance. Maybe it might take a few months. Yeah? So if you reach Sunaparanta. And there, the verbal Puna lived in Sunaparanta country. Then during the rains, the Venerable Puna established 500 laymen and 500 laywomen in the practice. Notice, 500 laymen, 500 laywomen, not nuns or nuns, you know. He established them in the practice. And he himself realized the three knowledges. In other words, he became a, an arahat. In due course, the Venerable Puna attained final Ripanga. Apparently, he, he died uh, within a year of his arrival in, in Sunaparanta. Then a number of months, of course, the blessed one has saluted him, and they saluted him, 
the center on one side and set this to the blessed one. Bhante, the clansman Puna, who was given a word of advice in brief by the blessed one, has died. What is his destination? destiny? What is his future cost? Bhikshus, the clansman Puna, was wise. He practiced in accordance with the Dharma and did not trouble me in the ministering of the Dharma. The clansman Puna has attained Vana Nirvana. The blessed one said this. The monks joyfully approve of the Blessed One's word. So this is the essence of the story of Puna. Any questions? From one of my overseas students. He's, he's a wonderful man. I mean, he, he, he's struggling with mental problems, schizophrenia and so on. And he's so fervent, he's so deeply faithful in Buddhism. He says that the practice of loving kindness has healed him, helped him. And he he just find that, you know, the other religion is not very helpful. In fact he tried to be tried to learn Zen and you know, these Tibetan teachings. But somehow he says they're not very helpful to him. I can understand that. Sometimes, you know, this is the sad truth. If you're not a rich, good-looking guy or, or girl, I tell you it's very difficult for you to really get good teachings from some kind of some of these groups. And this poor man, you know, if he has schizophrenia and he doesn't look, he's not that good-looking or imposing or, or influential or powerful, so he has no chance to learn the kind of Buddhism that he wants. This is the sad truth if you go around. And many of these people suffer in silence. So, but he was determined, and so he kept on studying the suttas. He found that the early suttas were really meaningful. And that is where he really enjoyed the sutta discovery. Then uh, recently he wrote to me and said, you know, I want to teach the Dharma. How do I do that? You know? So I, I told him, okay, you know, teach what you know. And uh, tell direct people to the website to, to put suttas. And from there, you find one thing is to so you are the guide. And as you teach, you also learn. So this is where you, you find that you're doing something useful also, and also it heals you as you do this. So you find all over the world, we have these little fire, fireflies of, of uh, lone Buddhists who are really determined to practice the Dharma. They're not interested in big group Buddhism, uh, Buddhist dinners, or dances, or whatever, they just want to learn the Dharma and be happy. So these are the little punas all over the world, so to speak. So if you are out there watching this video, read the Punavada Sutta. Be brave, study the Dharma, study the Sutta, so teach people what you know. And you find that uh, that itself will be rewarding when you meet people who are happy. They tell you, wow, you know, I discovered something about the Dharma. In fact, Puna became very popular because of his, his strength, his courage, his bravery. And uh, you find paintings of him in the caves in, in Ajanta. Ajanta is not too far away from Bombay. Yeah? And also in Kizil, which is a center somewhere in the Central Asia, you can, there's a map. You can look at the SC painting. Yeah? The pictures may vary in the new edition of this. Like 2013 edition is on page 146. Uh, 146 is the map of India showing where Sunaparanta is on the left side. A few more pages. Page 152, you see uh, Central Asia. Kizil is, uh, if you look at the word Tenshan at the top, can you see Tenshan? Under the S, the big letter S, you see Kizil. Q I Z I L. Kizil is just north of Kucha, notice? Yes. Yeah, Kucha. And then if you follow straight at 1 o'clock, you go to the right side. Can you see Tung Huang? Tung Huang? Yes. And then just below Tung Huang, what do you see? Mokau. Ah, Mokau Cave. Remember this famous cave where lots of teachings were found, you know? These teachings were teachings from north of China. And many of these manuscripts debunk 
some of the fixed ideas which we have of, of uh, China Buddhism today. For example, from all from the texts they discovered that they found, after some serious study, they found texts like the Six Petra Sutta. These this all were written later. They were not actually real classics as we know them to be. But that's another story. You can read all about this in how Buddhism became Chinese. Very fascinating uh, history here. You see the real story behind Buddhism, the struggle of power in China, in Chinese Buddhism. And there's also the story of Puna, Puna's brother. He was traveling overseas to Burma or South East Asia, and that was our area, yeah, to collect, uh, to, to, to look for sandalwood, chandana, yeah? red chandalwood especially. And the story went that when after they cut down this forest of nice big sandalwood, the, the spirits living in the forest were not too happy. And a big storm came out and the people were really in trouble, were terrified, everybody was praying, calling their own gods. But Puna's brother, Chula Puna, he, he just recited the precepts and, and then invoked his brother. And the story when his brother, uh, being an arahat with magical powers, actually came and appeared before them and helped them. And because of that, uh, everyone on the ship was converted. But this is a hagiographical story. The, this, the fact probably was simply that, you know, this, the brother probably showed great faith and the people accepted him and were, were kind of moved by his faith in, in, in the Dharma. And everyone was safe. So when they came back to Sunaparanta, they were so happy, they went to see Puna himself and built this beautiful pavilion for Puna. They made offerings, also they made offering to the brother, Puna. Then uh, Puna, uh, Puna is always very humble, he's very kind. So he, he didn't want to get all this, accept all these uh, benefits for himself. He, so he asked his people, have you heard of the Buddha? And people that said, no, never heard of the Buddha. Because they, they all are very far away, you know, it's the southwest of Saraki. Then, the, then the Puna says, okay, we'll make all these offerings for the Buddha. So they, pre they prepared offerings for 500 monks. The problem is your, the Buddha is so far away in Sawati. You need an athlete to come, 1,500 monks. So, the monks who come all must be full fledged parhat monks with the power of astral travel. <laughs> so, the Buddha told Ananda to select 500 monks. But the story also went that Sakra, Lord Sakra, knowing this, prepared 500 Vimanas. This is like a space story. <laughs> a Vimana is like a space capsule. So the story where each monk will go into this in meditation, and these 500 capsules will just whisk to the air <laughs> from Savati to uh, Sunaparanta. 500 Vimanas or space capsules, minus one, one is empty. Because that last one, the story goes, is reserved for someone called Satcha Banda. Satcha Banda, he was an ascetic living in the mountains between the two cities. And the Buddha stops them, teaches his person, and he was able to become an arahat, and he followed all the rest. So this is a storm of legends. But this is a legend with which has become very popular. So the Buddha went down to Sunaparanta, and he was given dana and all these things. People were very happy. And then he went to visit the Naga on the river Nambada. Nambada River is still there in India. And this story is very famous. The, the story when the Buddha visited this Naga and the Naga took him down to his kingdom. And then the Naga asked the Buddha for a relic to worship the Buddha. You know, Naga is not, I mean, doesn't really meditate like a, like a monk. Eh? So he wants to worship the Buddha. So the Buddha is not in the habit of giving autographs or or little amulets, you know. But so what the Buddha did was, he left his footprint on the bank of the river Navada. So the story went that he, he has to like get into this uh, uh, meditation one and he his the foot there. And, this, and the legend went that the moment the depression is made, it remains permanent. It may be hidden by the waves, but once the wave goes down, you can still see it. Okay, so it's, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a formation. So it's, it's 
some kind of uh, rock formation. Whether it's still there or not, I do not know. But I can tell you, I have seen such a big footprint in my own hometown in Malacca, in a place called Ayamole. I think it's still there. I call it the Buddha's footprint because I'm a Buddhist and I'm from Malacca. But the majority of the people in Malacca, the Malays, call it Hangkwa's footprint. So it depends who looks at it. And the footprint is quite big. It's this size, you know. It is embedded in the laterite. So if you leave it to the elements, it won't last very long. So I think they're protected in some kind of shape. Okay? So if I were a very pious Buddhist and I were a powerful Buddhist, I would say the Buddha also visited Malacca, my hometown. <laughs> and I, I probably can claim to some superpowers too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now back to the story in Nabada. So this event is so interesting that the thighs celebrate it. And you know what's the festival called? It's called the Loikatong Festival. You go to the Loikatong, yeah? They float those lights. You know why they float it? They float it to the river Napada to venerate the Buddha's uh, Pada Walanja, or Pada Chetia, the, the footprint shrine representing the Buddha. And then the Buddha went to the mountains, uh, met another Holy man, I think probably uh, in this little summer here, I forgot the same holy man, right? Just now. For Japanda, is it? Yeah. So he asked the Buddha also for relic. There's no water there, no bank. So what did Buddha do? The Buddha came to meditation mode and just gently pushed his footprint onto a hard rock. <laughs> and the legend went that there was the footprint permanently, not <laughs> disappear. So he got two footprints in, South, in, in Western India. So legend goes. Of course, if you were. You want to have a nice holiday of discovery, you can try and find out whether the prints are still there or not in Western India. It's very interesting to find out. Yeah? So these are stuff legends, some made of pious legends, and uh, you might see some of these formations in India, natural formation. I myself have seen this footprint in Malacca. And it depends whether you are the dominant culture there, you can declare whatever. You know, but of course in Thailand they say there's a Buddha footprint in Saraburi. Okay. So this this is a legend of Punna. According to Buddhism, as practicing Buddhist legends are nice to talk about. This is like uh, the colored advertisement lights, you know, we want to attract people, you know. But once they come, we want them to do the right, the real thing. That the greatest miracle is in your mind. To be at peace with yourself. Right? So stories are stories. So now later you got to understand their stories and you got to get back to the who the storyteller is, and then what the real story is, that is your own peace of mind. Okay, questions? Yes. Can the people still worship or pray the really power of right? It is a sense of power. If you look at the way people work, why people buy things, why people keep things, why people want to control people, it's all power. You have two aspects in life, power mode, love mode. Yeah? So you can get power in many ways. You can get power through money, through looks, through uh, what else? Position, titles, and so on. Yeah? And things, things. So if you have a Buddha rally and you say, this is the Buddha's tooth, you know? people say, wow, man, they'll come to you. But there's so many relics then you've got to make it bigger. So here you are, I've got a bigger relic. This is what you see in one of our commercial temples. Yeah. The experts have so this is not a human relic, probably a cow's tooth. It's so huge. Yeah. So this is this is superstition. This is attachment to rules, to, to, to uh, vows and rituals. You won't even attain stream meaning with this kind of belief. So this all came much later. So in a sense, Buddhism has not been reformed yet. There are lots of these wrong belief taught by the Buddhists themselves sometimes. So these are things we have to be very clear about ourselves. Of course, being Buddhist, we're very tolerant, no? So we say, it's all right. No, it's not all right. We just have to explain to them. The, the Buddha, in the suttas, 
has never permitted this kind of practice. It's very clear. He always say, look within, watch the breath, do your meditation. These extra, extra things are stories, maybe they, they, they are something to begin with, starting points, points of diversion, if you like. And so you bring them into something more peaceful. And here again, you, you notice it's easier to teach educated people than those who are not educated. Right? So in Asia, our education is just beginning to come up. So we have to try to a bit harder to educate people not to be superstitious and so on. So if you, that is why you do not build a sutra and you do your meditation, you have tasted peace, you are a great blessing to the community here. And if you are able to stand up and tell people this is the right way, if you even teach one other person, you convince this other person in the way of truth and self-effort, it's a great blessing, further great blessing. So we've got to be brave in telling people the truth. Otherwise, we are only hastening the dark ages of false teachings and false gurus. So this is where we have to remember the story of Buddha. Next week's book is on love, which is a very interesting book. So this is called the ship, the last page one six one. Nawa Sutta. The discourse on the ship, S forty five point one five eight. These are the parables. The Dharma is shown to be like a like a boat or a ship. You know? Again, self effort. Page one five one six two. Suppose we choose as an ocean going ship rigged with masts and stays, having been worn up by the water for six months, were to be hauled up onto dry land for the cold season. The ropes that have been worn up by the wind and sun, thoroughly soaked by the rains, will easily weaken and waste or rot away. So here we see awareness of the, the climate. You know? So during the cold season, they do not go out there, where there's no wind to travel to Southeast Asia, for example. By that time, the the rope which has been rain soaked for months in the monsoon, they become weak, can easily burst. So the Buddha is using this parable, this figure of this rope, which is soaked in water for a long time, easily broken. Even so, big sure it is with the monks who cultivate, continuously develops the noble eightfold path. His fetters will easily weaken and waste away or rot away. And how big sure does the monk cultivate continuously develop the A4 path so that his factors will easily weaken and waste away. Make sure here make sure he cultivates right view, right thought, right speech, right effort, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right samadhi or concentration. That is dependent on solitude, on letting go of craving or dispassion, on ending of suffering, a ripening in release. In this way, big shows the monk cultivates, continuously develops the noble effort path so that the, his fetters will easily weaken and waste away. So this is why the Buddha says, just go on practicing, don't give up. Don't expect immediately it to happen, but it will happen in due course. In fact, if you look at your life now, you have a lot of happiness compared to before you knew to this. There was another sutta I'm working on now, it's called Asaji Sutta. It's a story of Asaji, the youngest of the five months. He was very sick, so I asked the Buddha to come and see him. He told the Buddha, I'm so sick, I can't meditate, I can't, I can't calm my breath. I have failed. You know what Buddha told him? The Buddha says, in the training, in the Dharma training, we never say, I fail. No such thing. You just practice, you get it. And the Buddha gave similar teachings as the one they gave to Puna, and then Asaji, as we know, became an Aramat. So, in Dharma practice, we go on practicing. I always like to compare here Dharma practicing meditation like a baby, like a toddler learning to walk. The toddler never say, I fail. Yeah, the toddler cries, he falls down, right? he stands up again. And he went on doing that, and one day, walk. Well, we were the toddler before. We never say, I, I can't walk, can we? Have you ever had that thought? We just go on doing it. Meditation is so like that. Just go on doing it. And then, the, the, the truth will 
the rise of the compact semiconductors. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right, so once again, let us do a short reflection. Today we have completed volume 20 of the Sutta Discovery. The next week we'll do, we'll come start with a new volume, volume 38 on the nature of love which is, and compassion, which is a very inspiring one. Whenever you come here, you are strengthening our efforts to make sure that Dharma reaches more people, the future especially. So here is where we are preparing, we are laying the groundwork, the foundation for less superstition, less fear, less ignorance, less frivolity, more wisdom, more peace, more liberation in the future. Never think that your effort is small, because every time you come here, if you calculate the man hours, you calculate the effort that you have put in that benefit even more other people is very great. Because all these teachings are reaching out to a lot of countless other people out there throughout the world. Reflecting in this way, we create wonderful good karma. Where the power of such good karma may our minds quickly focus. May we be at peace with ourselves. May we be safe from harm and danger. And most importantly, may in this life itself we attain spiritual liberation, namely strengthening. And now, in the peacefulness of our hearts, let us send out our loving kindness to all those people important to us, our loved ones, and also to people who are lost in the Dharma, who have never tasted Dharma. May they come closer to the Dharma, open their hearts, and be free from suffering, ignorance, and danger. May all beings be happy and safe. Sad. 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 Sad.